Ladies and gentlemen, we are faced with a national emergency today. There is a country uh, that's dangerous, that is producing some effects that are costing our economy, that are costing us jobs, can cost lives, and are costing us infrastructure. We should build a wall around this country and make sure it never, ever can affect us again. I'm talking, of course, about Greenland. Uh, Josh Willis is live there right <laughs> now, in all seriousness. Josh Willis is there. He's a climate scientist. Uh, Josh, how are you doing? Andy, I'm doing great, man. Uh, I just flew for like 20 hours and two days, and uh, I made it here to Nuke, Greenland, and I'm at the Greenland Institute for Natural Resources uh, with Melina Sim Simon. Melina Simon. Simon. Yeah. Okay, I was close. Uh, and uh, she is the head of the Greenland Research Climate Center here, Cli uh, the climate Greenland Climate Research Center. <laughs> Sorry, I'll get this right eventually. Uh, the Greenland Climate Research Center, and uh, she's very graciously agreed to come uh, be on the show and talk to us a little bit today uh, about about Greenland and what they study here at the Greenland Institute. So uh, it's going to be an exciting show, man. Fantastic. Uh, we are here to uh, hear from some, some experts who are going to talk to us about why Greenland is the country we should really be talking about right now uh, when it comes to the United States. We're your prophets of doom. We're Hotpocalypse. He's a comic who's chronically depressed and thinks we're doomed. He's a renowned climate scientist who crunched the numbers and knows we're doomed. Together, they're hoping to have a good time till it's over and tell you, We're all gonna die. We're all gonna die. We're all gonna die. Ladies and gentlemen, wow, uh, it's great to be back. Uh, right now you're looking at your screen thinking, hey, uh, I love Hotpocalypse, love those two guys. Why is only the dumb one there now? Well, uh, it's because the other guy, it's like going to see Tears for Fears and only the ug ugly guy's there. There's no point. Uh, the smart one is in Greenland right now, and we are going to learn a bunch about Greenland. Josh, I am a tabla rasa. I'm like Larry King doing an interview. I have no idea what the hell I'm talking about today. Help me understand Greenland. And Andy, you're not dumb. You're just differently smart. Okay, so <laughs> don't let anybody tell it. you otherwise. <laughs> hey, buddy. Uh, I'm in Greenland, man. Hi. You look great. Isn't that weird? It is weird. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, considering the amount of sleep I've had since you've seen me last, it's uh, amazing that I'm standing and talking. Actually, you're sitting and talking, but uh, uh, here I am. Um, you look great. Yeah, right. I'm here... Uh, Thank you, thank you. It, it was not a short trip, but uh, it's it's a, it's amazing to be here right now. Um, I'm here to uh, work with some colleagues. As you know, uh, I'm a NASA climate scientist, and on this show, I never speak for NASA. All these opinions are my own. Uh, Andy sometimes speaks for NASA, but I speak you know. for the FDA today. That's who I would decide to speak oh, for. I'm, ma I'm making all the Food and Drug Administration uh, public uh, announcements today. But are you, so you don't Thank speak God. for NASA, fair enough. Right, uh, but, uh, but I do work for NASA and I'm here to collaborate with some colleagues uh, at the Greenland Institute for Natural Resources, one of whom is sitting right next to me, Melina Simone, who's, uh, she is Hi. the head <laughs> of the uh, Climate Research Center here, uh, here at the Greenland Institute. So uh, we're gonna talk to her about what's going on here in Greenland and uh, yeah, learn, learn a little bit about um, where I am since it's kind of show and tell day. Well, I, I think that's great because, you know, um, as a comic, the first thing that I wanted to do when I knew we wanted to talk about Greenland is I tried to find ways to make fun of people from Greenland. And I really am coming up short. Uh, we just, uh, I think the depth of our ignorance here in the States about what goes on there is so deep, we don't even have any stereotypes to draw from, like high cheekbones, uh, good so social service net. Uh, I got nothing. Uh, t what do I need to know about Greenland and why it's important right now? Uh, well, Andy, there's, there's one thing uh, that you should know, uh, and that's uh, Greenland is very icy. Wait, 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 wait. Iceland, then, must be very green. <laughs> At times. That's our is. show for today. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, um, well, a couple little tidbits about Greenland uh, just before we get started. So Greenland is the world's largest island. 
Uh, it's not considered a continent, um, but the definition of a continent is a little weird. Uh, but here you can see uh, the world, and this is what Greenland really looks like. There's the United States over there and Canada. And uh, Greenland is actually north of Canada. You know, we it's a little bit east, too, but it's mostly north. Um, and it's big. It's, uh, uh, as I said, the world's largest island. And we're kind of zooming in here and you can see the city of Nuke in the southwest uh, there. That's where I am right now. Oh, That's when you said you're going to Nuke, Greenland. Greenland, I thought you were just talking like an American, but you're actually going to a city <laughs> called Nuke in Greenland. Okay, right. clarified, it's, thank it's you. It's a city called Nuke. As far as I know, there are no <laughs> nukes here of any kind. Let's uh, keep it weapons, that way, Josh. Anyway. Keep the nukes yeah. to yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, Iceland or Greenland has enough ice, actually. It's covered by uh, an ice sheet that's almost two miles thick in some places. Whoa. And uh, it has enough ice that if it all melted today, it would raise sea levels globally by 25 feet. So it's a lot of ice. Whoa! Here. Okay. So, uh, so our question of why is Greenland so intensely relevant today? Uh, I think we're uh, closing in on our answer. 25 feet is, uh, is not a, a small amount of sea level rise. That would affect pretty much every human being on the planet in some way or another. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I mean, just two meters would completely displace 200 million people uh, across the planet. Uh, so seven and a half meters, uh, which is what 25 feet is, um, would, would displace uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. And now we don't think that all of the ice is going to melt anytime soon. It's going to take a while, but we really don't know how fast the ice here is melting. We know the climate's warming. We know the air is warming. Uh, and we also know that the oceans are warming. So ocean warming winds up uh, accounting for a certain amount of ice loss in Greenland as well. And uh, that's the reason, actually, uh, I'm part of a mission at NASA called Oceans Melting Greenland, um, or OMG for short. Very clever. That is very clever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was partly your comedy training that helped me. Uh, <laughs> we did it. <laughs> and we did it. Exactly. Uh, so Oceans Melting Greenland is um, an attempt to try and look at the big picture around Greenland and see if we can quantify how much the, uh, the ocean water is eating away at the ice. Because a lot of the ice in Greenland uh, runs off of the land into the water and actually sits below sea level. So uh, this ice is in direct contact with the oceans. Uh, it's feeling the warming oceans. And what we're trying to figure out is how much is that happening and, and how serious is, is, it, is it for uh, future ice loss in Greenland? Wow. Okay. So this, so this, uh, again, I think this yeah. is the national emergence <laughs> we see we should be talking about. But, uh, but so that water, uh, you're measuring it. So you go out there with, say, a teaspoon or a ladle. You get the water and you measure it. That's how the science works. Well, actually, what we do is we fly around in airplanes and uh, mm -hmm. we drop sensors out of the airplanes, right? <laughs> uh, and we also use a radar attached to AIN. And uh, these things tell us uh, about both the oceans and the ice. So the probes we drop, they fall into the ocean. Um, they measure the temperature and the salinity there and radio that data back to the plane. Uh, and then the other plane, we fly uh, a radar and it... Um, uh, it measures the height of the ice uh, all around the glaciers, uh, all the way around the edge of Greenland. And so we're trying to look for how is the ocean changing and how is the ice changing and how are those two things related? Wow. So uh, uh, that's my day job, Andy. That's what I do when I'm not making hot pocalypse. Wow, that's much better than mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I pleasure sailors at the docks for nickels. Uh, Maylene, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's get you involved in this. What, what is, uh, can you tell us about how Josh's research relates to what, uh, what you're discovering about Greenland and, uh, and what work uh, you take on in all this? Yeah, um, well, the, the work we're doing in the Climate Research Center is very much related to, to what Josh is doing, but we are taking it from a little bit of another side because 
we're very interested in how that's going to affect the, the Greenlandic society. And it's going to affect the Greenlandic society in a completely different way from the rest of the world. Um, we don't have any shallow beaches or we're not in danger of, of we're not threatened by sea level rise in Greenland as such. So we're looking more at how is it affecting our our ecology and economy and livelihood. Okay, wow. So, uh, yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, 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 so most people who live in Greenland, I, I guess we should say too, how many people live in Greenland? Yeah, all the Greenlanders. We're, <laughs> we're 57,000 people. What? And uh, in the, <laughs> yes. You guys got to get more people. You get, you get more yeah, we do actually. Like you, guys, you don't have enough folks. <laughs> There's, there's more people in L.A. in Starbucks right now <laughs> than there are in all of you. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's definitely right. true. 57,000 people. So it's, so it's not a heavily populated country. <laughs> no, it's, uh, we're pretty few people. and It's kind of a problem in the way that we, the really big resources that we need is human capacity and, and building the society and carrying out all the, the jobs that needs to be done for a, a normal society. Yeah, and so one of the things that I've noticed here is that uh, uh, there's still a strong um, desire to maintain a connection with uh, 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 hunting culture and uh, fishing. Hmm. And um, a lot of folks uh, still uh, live by, uh, by hunting and fishing right here in Greenland. Oh yeah. Um, almost everybody, I would say, I mean, also in the capital where people are also having other kinds of jobs, uh, we go to, to the fjord and we, we gather our, our meat from reindeer and muskox and we're fishing. So we fill up the freezers depending on the season. So that's a very normal thing. And that's what, everybody's basically doing wow, that's, um so that's really hunting and fishing sustenance. is very important wow okay. excuse that's, that's me that's really interesting yeah yeah sustenance and also uh, yeah and also the economy right the uh, the economy oh, yeah. defends very heavily on on fishing yeah yeah the whole the whole economy of the country is completely de depending on on fishing um 97 percent of our income is from uh, from fishing from shrimp and Greenland halibut. So that's very important. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Andy. No, no, go yeah. ahead, Josh. Um, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the relationship here at the Greenland Institute with um, helping, uh, helping the fishermen understand uh, the, the changing climate. And, you know, um, folks here are obviously very affected by climate change. Mm. Uh, so what role does the Institute play in that? Yeah, we have like the whole Institute as such is actually working very much with understanding the, the size of the populations of the, the living resources. So all the fish and whales and seals, etc. cetera. Um, but in the climate center, we are looking at it from the climate perspective. So how, how is, is, is the effects of climate change going to change the fishery and the, especially the marine ecology, because that's what we're depending on economically. Um, and then we we'll work very closely with the, the society, the communities, understand, explaining them what we can do and asking what they need to know to, uh, to better understand their environment. So, uh, so what is climate change doing to fish? Oh, um, really good stuff. No, I'm like actually, vitamins? <laughs> I'm actually more of a whale person, so <laughs> what I can say is the changing, changing actually really we can see it in the in the ecosystem. We have new species, um, changes of, of distrib distribution of species. We got some new fish species. A few years ago we caught the first tuna in Greenland. Wow. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. So um, it is affecting the society quite heavily and we have to adapt very quickly to, to be able to change the fisheries. Wow. Yeah. Let me, let me ask real quick, Melina. Uh, so 
Here in the States, uh, climate is a very political issue. And, I, and I've run into people, say, from Canada who are just sort of amazed by the fact that it's seen as a political rather than a scientific issue. Uh, how is it viewed in Greenland? And I guess, you know, you guys are at the epicenter of, uh, of worldwide climate disaster right now in the, in the sense that your country is melting uh, to a certain extent. What, what does that look like to you in, in terms of, how do you guys feel about us? We're, we're putting a lot of the carbon in the air that's uh, doing this. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean. I mean, um, it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's interesting. And we, we see it in another way. I mean, we're concerned about sea level rise, of course, uh -huh. uh, from a global perspective and politically and like, yeah, the whole situation that, that can cause. Um, in Greenland, we have, when we talk about climate change, we talk about which opportunities we'll get, um, which is very important uh, in relation to farming and uh, diff different different ways we have to adapt. So we have to, to do the fisheries differently. For example, fisheries that's been happening from the sea ice now has to change into boat fisheries. And so it's more about day-to-day -day, uh, adaptations to how to to survive in the communities and as a as a society it, it almost sounds like it's uh, whereas in the united states we oftentimes treat this as sort of a theoretical or hypothetical uh issue whereas it almost sounds like you're dealing with it as a current reality that has to be dealt with practically yeah Oh, interesting. Well, I don't have anything, every, anything to else about. is um, <laughs> that, yeah. well. We, I mean, for to to not treat it as a reality is for us a little bit ridiculous or pretty ridiculous. We see it every day in our in our backyard. We have the glacial fjord just outside the window, and we see the retreats. We see the changes in the ecosystem almost year to year. So uh, definitely, that's that's part of our our, our life. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one thing that I found when I first started coming here is that uh, I'd been looking at Greenland from a, a great distance uh, from the United States, but also from satellites and from all these uh, very remote um, uh, streams of information. And coming here and seeing it for myself, uh, I could actually uh, see the places along the sides of the fjord where the glaciers had uh, scoured away the dirt um, and then retreated. So you can see sort of this bathtub ring around the fjords in uh, so many places around Greenland. That's an indication of how the ice is, is retreating. But uh, really nothing compares to talking to folks that have lived here their entire lives and uh, hearing them kind of describe the, uh, the changes that they see and um, and how profound they are. So it really uh, creates a, a very personal connection with the changes that we're seeing that I think most people don't ever get to experience. Yeah, unless you're literally in a hurricane, you probably aren't going to see those effects as directly right. here in the stage. Uh, right. That's, right. Uh, that's uh, disturbing and uh, fascinating. Uh, Maylene, uh, another uh, US-centric question. Do you guys get free healthcare? Do we get what? Free healthcare. Yeah. What's that like? <laughs> oh, that must be awesome. Next episode, we're going to ask you how awesome that Absolutely. is because it sounds really great. <laughs> it's uh, well, I think that's 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 yeah. I I, I I've never tried anything <laughs> else. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. I think uh, it's absolutely necessary for any society to get that. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> that is uh, that is beautiful. It's like a song coming from your lips. Uh, I'm seeing a question here on our, uh, and feel free to weigh in with questions, comments for our experts here on the Being Liberal uh, Facebook page. I'm seeing one uh, sort of interesting question: Is Greenland rising at all? I don't even know what that means. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. The answer is yes. Right. Um, and the reason, yeah, the reason is, is exactly because of the ice melt. Um, so as the, uh, there may be other things going on as well, but at least partly as the ice retreats, um, it lifts a, a lot of weight locally off of the land and the land literally rebounds. 
And uh, there are GPS stations all around the edges of Greenland that are measuring this, uh, this rebound as the ice retreats, uh, the land pops back up. Um, and in fact, uh, you can uh, model the physics related to this and show that uh, whenever Greenland loses ice, uh, sea level here in Greenland actually goes down. Um, the only way to make sea level go up here is for like Antarctica or some distant place to lose ice. I think I'm starting to understand why uh, why climate scientists might want to spend a lot of time in this area. Uh, it's, it sounds like this is really a, a, a pivot point for a lot of climate issues. Plus, if you fall and break your leg, free doctor. So I get it. I get it, Josh. I get your game. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, the free health care is uh, terrific. Uh, is, is, uh, is there anything uh, that you'd like to tell us here in the States? Uh, it, it, any message besides maybe uh, stop buying Hummers and uh, burning coal? Is there anything that, that we should know about Greenland or uh, <laughs> as we continue to be affected by each other uh, that people in the States should know about your country? Well, I, I think actually... It's important to know that it's a very, it's a modern country. Uh, it's a modern society. Um, normally when you're, when you're searching on Google, you'll find um, igloos and <laughs> dog sledges, which we do have, we do have dog sledges and they are working as a tool, but, and, but we also have a, a very modern democracy and um, a modern society. And um, that's something that many people don't really know. And also, uh, I think it's important of, to uh, say... Same could be said of Texas, that, uh, by the way, where Josh is from. It's not all cowboys, right, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of variety There's no free health care in Texas, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. Never, ever. Uh, well, that's wonderful. Yeah, Thank you so much, guys. Uh, oh, go ahead, Malik. Yeah, I just wanted to say that's pretty special for uh, at least for, for the Antarctic community that uh, Greenland is having its own government. So it's, it's Greenland uh, connected to Denmark, but it's a Greenlandic government. And that's many people who doesn't know that as well. I had no idea. So the 57,000 people uh, sovereign. Well, it's connected to, to Denmark. But uh, it is uh, having its own self-government. Well, uh, yeah, that's good. I'm glad. All right, Greenland. Doing it <laughs> real big. Way to go. Exactly, right? Yeah. 50,000 uh, well-organized uh, <laughs> people with health care. Yep, that's it. <laughs> that's beautiful. It's not all Eskimos and Vikings. <laughs> Vikings? I don't even know if that's relevant. Hey, uh, you guys, this is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Being liberal, uh, we've got so many comments and questions. We're going to get to those as we go. Uh, we've got uh, climate FOMO coming up, and we've got the reasons why we're all going to die this week. Uh, every week we prophesize your doom, and every week we're right. Uh, we're going to get to all that. I, I don't know if Melina's going to, be, going to be able to stick around and address questions as they come in. Uh, we never want her to go away, so, if, uh, so whatever she's able to do. Yeah, you, you sure. want to stick around? Yes, yeah, sure. great, great, yeah, yes. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, you guys, there's a bunch of reasons why we're all going to die. Uh, and I'll bet we have an intro about to play out why this, we're all going to die this week. We're all gonna die, we're all gonna die, we're all gonna die. Apocalypse. So, uh, Josh, let's talk through this. There's a bunch of reasons why we're all going to die this week. <laughs> that graphic week. never gets old, buddy. It never gets old. No matter how late and awkward we yeah, awkwardly uh, we introduce it in the show, always works. Killer. Uh, <laughs> it always works, yeah. Let's talk Elon Musk AI. Two words which we knew wouldn't yeah. go together well, right? <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, this, is gonna be, this is gonna be creepy. Well, so, so Elon Musk is involved in this uh, project to develop artificial intelligence, and they have created a, uh, a program or an algorithm that's so good at what it's doing in terms of replicating text, so fake text uh, writing, so uh, writing in the style of James Joyce and having it pass the Turing test. Uh, it's gotten so good that they're not going to release it publicly because they think it might be very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I mean, I think of Skynet, Andy. Pretty soon, there's <laughs> going to be Terminators. 
Uh, we're all we're all living in Skynet. We're just uh, we're just waiting to sell it. It's our data. That's uh, that's our that's new right. plan with Skynet. Now, don't stop it. Sell your data at a reasonable price. <laughs> right. <laughs> But uh, I, yeah, I mean, this I, is I guess I want to uh, I mean, point the steely finger of blame right now at you scientists, you guys right now, uh, <laughs> uh, once again, developing tools that humanity doesn't know how to deal with. Yeah, I know. We we just can't help ourselves, right? I mean, uh, the temptation's too great. Uh, no, too but great. this is well. Uh, please, please have some smoked fish and calm yourself down, friend. Uh, <laughs> okay. The next no, this one kind of we're all going to die this week. Oh, sorry, the Himalayas, you guys, not looking good in the Himalayas for ice. Yeah, right. I mean, there's another uh, ice cap that we often don't remember uh, in the Himalayan uh, plateau. And there's actually a pretty good amount of ice there. It's nothing like Greenland and nothing like Antarctica, uh, but it is melting. And um, some of the projections suggest that by the end of the century, uh, most of the ice there could be melted. Um, wow. Which is way faster than we had thought in, in previous uh, recent assessments. So, um, so it's, it's alarming. And, and even our 1.5 degree target uh, that we're trying to keep global warming down to uh, would still result in quite a lot of ice loss in the Himalayas, which is a problem for uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the societies that depend on them for uh, as a source of water. Yeah. So it's um, it's a potentially really large catastrophe waiting to happen. And if I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, real near uh, Bangladesh. And then uh, that's a low-lying, very heavily populated area that's going to be sort of on the uh, at the tip of the spear of uh, climate change, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Ah, that's right. Uh, it's, uh, that's, they're uh, they're definitely in the bullseye. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and thus we drink. Cheers, everybody. Coffee this morning. It's oh. too early. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the point. next reason why we're all going to die this week, let's take a look at this one, uh, is, uh, oh, Josh, again, steely yeah. finger of blame at scientists. <laughs> what the heck uh, is up with you guys getting the, uh, the standard model of physics wrong? Uh, we've just discovered that there's a, a measurement of dark matter in oh. the universe that seems to show that the standard model of physics is awry. Uh, Josh, explain yourself. I blame you personally. <laughs> okay, well... Yeah, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of stuff in the universe that the astronomers can't see, and so it's called dark matter because they can't see it because it's not emitting any light. Great but they name. know it's there because it, yeah, they know it's there, and the reason they know it's there is because if it wasn't there, the universe would just have flown apart already. Uh, so it's got to be there with gravity, kind of keeping everything together. And uh, what this found out, um, what what this uh, 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 recent study. Uh, seems to suggest at the beginning is that um, uh, something's wrong, like they can't count enough of it, or uh, uh, they. Um, uh, it, it seems to be having a bigger effect than they can kind of account for. Uh, but I will say that this is also one of those things where uh, you're going to have to wait 10 years for the answer, because right. uh, this project is is only just beginning they've only analyzed 10 percent of the data that they've collected so wow. uh you By know my math don't. that's not even half uh you're Josh, right it would, it, <laughs> it would seem that like um it, I, I think it's interesting to uh to talk particularly to scientists about this because it seems like this is a conundrum that science faces because of its attention to detail and uh getting the facts right when something is wrong, it throws off a whole series of conclusions and extrapolations based on that one fact that uh, that doesn't seem to be the place it is. How do you deal with that as a scientist? How do you deal with that chaos within uh, these very uh, uh, highly studied systems? Well, people don't realize that science is a messy process, right? I, I mean, you know, it's always three steps forward, two steps back. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, I, I have some experience with this in my own career. Uh, many years ago, I helped write a paper that said the oceans were cooling, um, and it turned out to be totally wrong. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and for that, Rush Limbaugh uh, called me an idiot leftist scientist. But that's neither, <laughs> that's a story for another day. But, uh, uh, but, you know, it turns out that oftentimes 
you know, the way science is really established, and this is what you have to remember, is that it's not just one scientific discovery that changes the whole world. Um, something gets discovered and then people double check it and they go back and they look at the uh, weight of all the evidence and they do more experiments and, and uh, try to poke holes in it. Um, scientists spend at least half their career picking on other scientists, uh, probably more than they do just making new results happen. So uh, it's a very adversarial, very messy process. And over time, we come to know things very, very well. And so, for example, with global warming, it's not like somebody just discovered, hey, this is happening. Uh, it's, the, it's the weight of all these thousands and thousands of discoveries and people rehashing the data and, and uh, scrutinizing it and, and, um, and going through it. And what's happening here with the dark matter is that they're uh, still at the beginning of that process. All right, that's a, that's a great answer. I I I, I always feel like people uh, who accuse the scientific uh, community of conspiring uh, to promote the idea of uh, climate change. It's a little like uh, accusing the Green Bay Packers and the Chicago Bears of conspiring to play a football game. Uh, the, it's it's not a team process. It's adversarial, and people don't get along. It's uh, actually kind of funny to watch the Poindexters fight. Am I right? <laughs> oh, yes. There's nothing like seeing nerds beat each other up. Nerd fight! I love it. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this next one that we want to talk about, I believe this is a last of our reasons why we're going to die this week. Ooh, ooh. Han Solo. Ooh, What's ooh. going on? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Han Solo, um, who uh, fought two different Death Stars and a giant planet that shoots laser beams... Um, recently came out and said that climate change is uh, the biggest moral like crisis that humanity faces. Oh. So, you know, not even Darth Vader was as bad as climate change. Wow. Uh, and we're, of course, talking about Harrison Ford, uh, who played right. Han Solo. Also, sometimes took I on forget the his real name. Witness. I mean, this guy has a career against <laughs> big enemies and he wins. So th we got we got a win yeah. on our side. Definitely. <laughs> did he shoot first or did Greedo shoot first? Oh, he definitely shot first, but he Nerd won. Fight. That's the important thing. <laughs> Just keeps happening. Uh, uh, Josh, uh, good news. Uh, that is it for the bad news this week. And we're going to end with a bunch of good news and audience questions. Is that exciting? That's, exa that's very exciting. But before we get there, Josh, we got a sponsor. What? Yeah. Are, are you serious? Internet money now with our with our new sponsor. That's crazy talk. I don't believe you, man. No, it's amazing. Uh, l let's hear let's uh, let's hear from our new sponsor. Please buy their product. We need clothes. At the Beretta Nine Mill, we want our our own area where we can just be white. I mean, you know, the problem is they're killing each other anyway. And I don't know. Uh, I think that's my twenty three and Me account. So hang on. <clears throat> no! 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 Race is a cultural construct. With all the things that define us genetically, some people focus on race. Here at 23andMe, we probably have terrible news. Your grandparents used to swing with Persian Croatians. You have a cousin from Brazil, and your grandmother only fucked Cherokees. Your dad's a Puerto Rican, and your mom's a liar. Here at 23andMe, we know that if you learn what your genetic heritage actually is, nine times out of ten you'll be like, holy shit, I can't believe it, my dad said we were Irish or something. We now put things as bluntly as possible. Your grandfather's aunt was filled with more Jews than a synagogue. What? This is the kind of Nigerian prince email where you actually find out you're a Nigerian prince. Besides, who cares? When you go to the pound, the purebreds are always the stupid ones. Your half-brother's aunt was full of Siamese semen. You know how you get purebred white people? Cousin fucking. These assholes are running around telling everyone who will listen that they're from a puppy mill. Instead, celebrate. <laughs> 23 and me. This machine kills fascists. Oh, we'll give you something to cry about. Wow, wow. That guy wow. had weird hair, wow. didn't he? The weird hair on that dude. 
Need, he, he did. Need more conditioner, did. I think. Uh, it was a good looking. He was a good looking salesman. I'll give him that. <laughs> Bless your heart. You're, you're talking about the bald racist, right? The guy was crying. No, he's a good looking guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, uh, Melina, I, we've got a question here in the comments. Again, uh, on the Being Liberal Facebook page, feel free to leave us some uh, questions and comments for our experts. Uh, oh, that changed. Uh, Paris wants to hear about the cousin fucking part. Uh, no, this one is, I want to hear more about climate change and the whales. Ah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do, uh, that's um, a big question. Uh, what, 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 what does yeah. your research tell you about what's happening with whales and climate change? Well, they're, they're, they're changing their distribution. So whales, that's usually in the more temperate areas they're moving further north and they're kind of pushing the arctic species further north um also the the food of whales is changing and of course that's affecting the whales as well some of the whales are doing good with climate change because they get a bigger habitat oh so there's some um, winners in climate so change it's for not all so it's it's sort of like moving to the suburbs <laughs> yeah. <I guess>. Okay. <laughs> the oceans are gentrifying. Is that what I'm hearing? It's a longer commute, but you get a much bigger house. Mm, a lot yeah. of white cats. <laughs> I hear what you're saying in this ocean thing. <laughs> uh, so, right. so, Malia, so, so, I guess what you're saying is, in, in your area of research with whales and climate, it's it's sort of a transition mixed bag. Some whales are thriving, some are really suffering, uh, but it's a dynamic. Is that right? Yeah, it, it kind of depends on which species we're talking about. Um, the Arctic species that are only in the Arctic, um, they are more pressured in the sense that their habitat is, is getting smaller and it, the, the, the food prey the, is, um, is changing as well. So, and yeah, so it, it really depends on which species you, 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 you're focusing on. I hear you. I hear you. Excellent. So let's uh, move on, if we shall, to the good news of the week, Josh. Good stuff is happening. We got climate FOMO, uh, we call it. Fear of missing FOMO. out. Good stuff we don't want to miss out on. N yeah, let's, uh, l let's have some good news, Andy, please. All right. Well, please. Let's, so let's start <laughs> off with uh, news that U.S. solar, the solar industry in the United States, is booming. Doing very well, uh, breaking all projections for what was going to be happen. We're also seeing on the cost curve, we're seeing coal's expenses rising. It's getting more and more expensive to use coal, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper to use solar. We're seeing those uh, graphs cross each other, which is very good news uh, for the climate, for the whales, and for uh, nuking Greenland. Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Uh, wow, well, that, that was so exciting uh, to actually um, hear solar panels getting a good rap for a change, right? Right. Yeah, after, uh, after all the abuse that's been heaped on them by the current administration, they, they, they're still thriving. And Josh, tell me if I got this right. Uh, it's because solar is a technology, not a resource. So it gets cheaper and cheaper and better and better, whereas uh, a resource just stays what it is. is. Is that kind of why these curves are operating the way they do? Yeah, I mean, the, the sun is just doing its thing, you know, sending us all this energy. Uh, all we have to do is figure out how to use it. And um, the solar panels are the most direct way. They literally turn sunlight into electricity. And uh, so, yeah, uh, as technology improves, as we get better at making them, uh, as we scale up production of, uh, of solar panels, they get cheaper and cheaper. Uh, meanwhile, it gets harder and harder to find new sources of oil, of coal. Uh, of course, we you know where a lot of them are, but uh, digging them up is expensive, uh, causes global warming, and uh, and so forth. And in fact, you know those costs actually the cost that you pay of for uh, fossil fuel energy doesn't include the cost of climate change, right? You're paying the cost of just digging it up and burning it but you're not paying the cost of the impact that it has on the global climate. So uh, in fact, if you really look at real costs, the, uh, the overall cost of the fossil fuels is way higher than uh, renewables and, and always has been and always will be. 
Fascinating, fascinating. And I, and, I, and I love, Josh, you make these issues very relatable and down to earth, and it results in you saying funny things like, the sun is just doing its thing. <laughs> Which is, uh, I love it. I love it's it. Doing uh, its thing, so Andy. That's great. It's that's great. And that's, uh, that's important. Now, Josh, this next bit of good news, guys, this might not be good news to you. It's great news to me. Uh, LSD is becoming uh, legally accepted in some areas and used as therapy. Uh, and it can help people wow. get over depression. And that's a lie because I'm depressed all the time, and you should have seen me in college. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's exciting. We're expanding uh, our minds about how to expand our minds. Tim, Timothy Leary must be rolling over in his cryogenically frozen grave right now. Rolling over doing that sort of deadheady dance, right? The, the trippy. Yeah, right. They kind of. <laughs> Here's a question I want you scientists exactly. to think about. Why do people take acid and go to like fish shows? When what you really need it is at a boring con like take acid and go to a smash mouth concert. Like, you know, you can, you can really take boring content and make it interesting with this drug, apply it right. and use uh, cases where it's necessary. That's all I'm saying, guys. It's the hill You're I'm saying LSD today. is wasted on a fish concert. That's right. Oh, okay. yeah. If we've learned anything today. <laughs> Melina knows where I'm at. She's with me on this. Uh, you guys, <laughs> I'm not going to drag you into my disease, Melina. Don't worry. Uh, so a, another bit of good news this week. Wisconsin, as a state, has agreed to honor the Paris uh, Climate Accords, which is uh, unusual. But 20 states have done this. Wisconsin is just the latest. Awesome. Go cheeseheads. Yeah. Who would have thought? Right? By the way, two Wisconsin references, one show. How about it? Who would have thought? Uh, we've <laughs> That's, got Wisconsin amazing. really leading the way, which isn't how we think about Wisconsin. No, no. I mean, we definitely think of like cheese curds and, Beer. uh, you know, football. Yeah. Um, but not, not like climate supremacy. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've never thought, well, I've got to reposition them in my head. I think of them as a place to yeah. ski, uh, uh, eat cheese and, uh, make fun of you for not being from Chicago. That's what we did with people from Wisconsin. <laughs> we got, we got to expand our minds. Uh, the next bit of good news, <laughs> Australia. Another area we don't expect to lead in anything but rednecks and surfboard accidents uh, <laughs> actually is, is leading the way in batteries. And they've got a new thing that they're doing. Have you, have you heard about this, Josh? Are you familiar? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I read that they're like squirting water into an old well. Josh, I love it when you dumb it down for me. It's how I get my information. That's exactly right. This old zinc mine, they're, they're injecting water and air, uh, and that stored energy, just in, the terms, in terms of kinetic energy, is then able to be released later. Uh, so you're effectively using it as a battery. Uh, very clever, these Aussies. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, they have a really nice, very technical video uh, on their website, but uh, this company is is making um, uh, it's it's sort of like a, a sort of natural battery. You compress a bunch of air, uh, you also generate a bunch of heat, and then you save the heat and you save the compressed air for when you need it, and then you kind of undo all that and use it to turn uh, generators and regenerate the electricity. So it's a way of saving the electricity, uh, kind of banking the electricity for times that you need it. Uh, cool. And that turns out to be really important because oftentimes you're uh, generating power with wind, say, at night when you don't need very much electricity um, and it's uh, not put to good use. So this this allows us to use more of the power that we generate. Wow. Uh, it's amazing. I, again, we don't associate the Aussies with this. Last uh, Last technological development they had was knives. They were like... That's not a knife. <laughs> this is a knife. That's <laughs> <laughs> like a little Australian joke, guys. Uh, uh, Good job. Good job. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks. I, I, I stayed up late last night working on that joke. It really panned out well. <laughs> it shows, buddy. That was a great one. <laughs> now, what, now, what is the rest of you guys' day like? What, or, uh, where are you in your day? Are you guys going to be doing science things? How are you going to save the world for the rest of the day? <laughs> well... <laughs> Uh, I'm told there's beer and pizza eventually, or maybe that's tomorrow. Uh, no, uh, 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 I'm going to get a good night's rest tonight, actually. Um, it's uh, almost 4 p.m. here in, in Nuke. So we're five hours ahead of L.A. 
And uh, um, tomorrow, we're Greenland, uh, Nuke, and Melina here is uh, hosting the first ever National Climate Day for uh, for Greenland, um, and which uh, I'm participating. I'm going to give a talk, and I'm going to sing a little Elvis song too. Yeah, great. Uh, we've seen a little bit of Climate Elvis on the show before. It is a stone cold delight, <laughs> and uh, I'm excited that you're going to rock. Uh, you're going to nuke nuke. You're going to you're going to make it crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the whole town is going to be there. <laughs> oh, it's very yeah, exciting. So tell us We're a little about, Yeah, uh, tell us a little about Climate Day if you got it. Climate Day, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, it's 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 a ten year center. So we decided to make a party in the cultural house, and um, we invited artists and uh, it's entertainers and scientists in all sorts of different scientific areas and politicians and well. Basically, anyone who is working with climate change in their daily life in Greenland. So Very cool. it's going to be a big event with a lot of different activities. A shindig. It sounds <laughs> like Oktoberfest with a Scandinavian twist. <laughs> <laughs> I just made that up. Indeed. Uh, and, and let's remind <laughs> folks that we've got a comment section here uh, on the Being Liberal webpage. Uh, we want you to go to our Hot Pocalypse Facebook page, like us, follow us, go to our Twitter page. Uh, you can find us on SoundCloud, YouTube. Please find us on all these places. And uh, on the Being Liberal website, you can go to the comment section. You can comment, ask questions. If we don't get your comment or question during the show, we will try to get it after the show. Uh, and uh, we also, I just think, really need to thank uh, Melina for uh, for helping us out today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. It's been fun. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I told you guys the smart people would weigh in at some point and tell us what was up. Uh, Josh, <laughs> uh, have a great trip, man. We'll see you next week, right? Hey, thanks, buddy. Uh, uh, I'll I'll bring home some good pictures and. Uh, uh, some stories for next week, too. Yeah, bring me a Viking. Is that right? Am I getting this right? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, have fun. Uh, tell yeah. everyone in Greenland we said hi individually, and uh, we love you guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thank